Fleet carriers remain one of the most powerful and simultaneously the most squandered features in the entire game, even more so than engineering. While I remain optimistic about the future of this feature, it's important to weigh this system in its appropriate context, especially in light of the decision to omit console development from future development. There were a lot of decisions about fleet carriers made in the final months leading up to their arrival that I found to be questionable. Some of these decisions were clearly motivated by developer crunch, others seemed punitive, arbitrary, and formulated to pad out the amount of time players have to spend connected to the game. A few of these decisions amount to a massive missed opportunity that would, and still could, add up to make fleet carriers a core fulcrum in Elite Dangerous. In this video, I want to go over the current disposition of fleet carriers, their effects on gameplay, and make suggestions that will improve the usability and gameplay relevance of fleet carriers as a whole. This, in contrast with their current position in the game, which amounts to a very expensive yacht that veteran players use to caddy around the bubble. Fleet carriers were originally envisioned by Frontier as rally points for different communities to operate, and which would require effort from the whole community to sustain and improve. It was stated in live streams that these massive ships would operate with the same mechanics as capital interceptors from the Empire or Federation. Namely, that they would have upgradable weapons, support fleets, destructible subsystems, and require logistical support from players. There were a myriad of other promises made which, in addition to the ones mentioned here, have only partially been delivered on. What we were given was a significant step down from the ambition that made fleet carriers so appealing in the first place. These ships were intended as congregation points for different communities in Elite Dangerous, as rally points that organizations could use to coordinate activities, as forward operating bases and trading hubs for the player-controlled aspects of the economy. The core of this mechanic was collaboration, and its framework fundamentally that of a business simulator game something Frontier has demonstrated an abundance of competence building and supporting, with most of their current titles being administrative simulation games of one style or another, which is what made the launch of Fleet Carriers especially confusing for me. All the ingredients are in the batter to bake a good cake, but for whatever reason they haven't been properly mixed or balanced or baked long enough to realize the latent potential. We were promised a community-owned asset, where large numbers of players could congregate, where owners could consolidate squadron and individual assets from multiple players, where alternatives to station services could be provided, even in systems without any infrastructure. What we were delivered was a mass-produced mess of assets and designs that were intended for one type of game economy, and were shoehorned into an entirely different one. Most of the issues fleet carriers had on launch and still have now, were created by the decision to transition fleet carriers from community assets to individual ones, a decision which resulted in the need for a massive rebalance of almost all the assets and resources that tie into them, and one which has resulted in an environment so over-competitive in practice that the value of the fleet carrier as a whole has been radically reduced. Almost nobody I've spoken to generates revenue with their fleet carriers using the tools it provides. Few players congregate around them due to the abundance of choice. There's just so many carriers that you can dock at. Many players choose to pass on the mechanic, being generally able to find a fleet carrier wherever they go and feeling no strong incentive to chase this massive time sink and own one themselves. True, some carrier owners have found the odd market or community niche that suits their fancy and lets them generate passive revenue the way that the game originally intended. But these commanders are the exception and not the rule. Most fleet carriers are operated at an average loss, earning almost none of their upkeep costs through the passive methods intended in the design. Almost all carriers are financed primarily by their owners, through the owner's gameplay. Update 11, taken in this context, does improve the overall disposition of the fleet carrier platform. Carrier interiors now make Odyssey feel more impactful to space-centric commanders like me who have rarely interacted with the on-foot component of the game after the initial novelty wore off. The carrier jump sequence feels more impactful and immersive anywhere you can find a window, and the extra level of interaction around seats was a very underappreciated and important addition to the player tools in Odyssey. 
both for roleplay purposes and for the overall immersive value of the environment interaction itself. Carrier shipyards, genomics, and pioneer outfitting are mostly scaffolding, built on a foundation footing that I hope gets properly sheeted and framed with more management and inventory tools, as the current iterations mostly run in the background and can be safely ignored or forgotten about. My carrier, for example, currently does not have these services equipped, and for the moment, I have no plans to do so, since nobody aside from myself uses my carrier. I have yet to bother with surface exploration in Odyssey, and I already own all the weapons I need from Pioneer Outfitting. By far the most significant tool provided in Update 11 is the Bartender, and related engineering materials exchange that it supports. At launch, this feature had only 100 units of total capacity across all available materials, which was horrible, and almost completely destroyed any value the feature would have provided. But, thankfully this was addressed in a hotfix that raised the limit to 1,000, effectively doubling the storage capacity available to individual commanders, who could already carry 1,000 total units in their personal inventory. I remain convinced that shared inventory pools for Odyssey is a mistake for the exact same reasons it was in Engineering 1.0 for ships. Shared engineering material pools force players to constantly shuffle their inventory around through the exchange system, taking a loss each time. It's an aggravating and arbitrary damper to gameplay that clashes with the superior mechanics available in Horizons. There need to be specific item limits rather than a massive shared pool, and the bartender needs an even higher inventory cap. But for now, the improvement is appreciated, and the bartender is much more usable than it was a week ago. Previous issues aside, this is the first time that players have been allowed to exchange engineering materials of any kind, and it will have the effect of allowing players to further specialize into their preferred gameplay while also letting them reap a direct reward from other players for their efforts by selling engineering materials they don't need. This is something I expect third-party tools will very quickly adapt to support, and is something that frees up the Odyssey progression system to enable faster acquisition of suits and weapons. Altogether, Update 11 moves the ball forward, continuing to improve the suite of available tools by adding new functionality to carriers. This, however, does not mean that fleet carriers, engineering, or the game as a whole, are where they need to be. Fleet carriers in general still need a lot of attention, quality of life improvements, and added functionality to be able to reach the level that the community has been hoping for. Here, we transition from a preview of Update 11 specifically to a detailed overview of what the ideal carrier could look like. The suggestions I provide here are intended to address the fleet carrier mechanic as a whole, are derived from discussions I've had with other players, and from sentiments expressed across the community in varying forms over the last two years. As with previous videos, they are offered with the intention of clearly documenting these items in the event Frontier ever decides to revisit them. Carrier Specialization and Competition Density There is an analogy that gets tossed around in business when describing a given market, where the market itself is described as an ocean, and the level of competition described as the redness of that ocean. Referencing blood in the water, red oceans are crowded markets full of companies in aggressive competition with one another for that market's available revenue. The redder the ocean, the more aggressive the competition, the more difficult it is to operate a viable business. Blue oceans are the opposite. Clean, clear markets with few operators and limited competition where the participants are able to collect large margins in a much lower pressure environment. To use a real-world comparison, David Braben and Chris Roberts, the CEOs of Frontier and Cloud Imperium respectively, both realized there was a massive blue ocean that had developed around the space sims market back in 2014, and they successfully campaigned to fill that void. Nobody was making space games at the time, so consumers had few options and showered both men in mountains of revenue to play something that was unique in the marketplace. Though they both, in doing this, proved in no uncertain terms that the space sim market was undervalued, very blue, and very rich. That signal drove fresh competition into the market over the next few years, and now we find, today, the space sim genre a rapidly reddening ocean full of companies trying to draw limited player bases from each other's games. Fleet carriers in Elite Dangerous are one of the reddest oceans in the entire game environment, 
with literally thousands of these ships operating across the entire inhabited bubble and colonia, nearly all of which offer the same tools and capabilities as one another. Because of the sheer volume of vessels and the multitude of competitors, only the most savvy, aggressive, and dedicated carrier owners are able to use the player tools the carriers currently provide to generate passive income. As a result, most carriers in operation in Elite Dangerous operate at a loss, subsidized by their owner's personal gameplay, which means that the logic of a decision to buy a fleet carrier is skewed. I bought a fleet carrier expecting it to be an asset, expecting to be able to generate passive revenue that I could reinvest into it, building something that could be a hub for friends and Discord servers. That gameplay never materialized. And to date, the sole reason that I keep my carrier is because it takes less time to jump at once with all my ships aboard than the hour or more per week I used to spend performing shipyard transfers at different stations across the bubble to keep my ships where the activities I wanted to play were located. As a result of this, I run my fleet carrier with only basic services, a voucher office, and recently a bartender. The voucher office is disabled most of the time, and the bartender is just an extremely restrictive backpack into which I can dump engineering materials and maybe sell a few of them. The only factor I give any consideration to is the individual utility of the service that I equip. The possible business uses are not even a factor because they are far too economically irrelevant to be seriously considered by most players in the game. An asset once intended for entire communities has been reduced to a pleasure yacht and status symbol for individual veteran players, every single one of which reduces the functionality and value of every other carrier. For fleet carriers to realize their full potential, there needs to be a rebalance of the buy-in process, the upkeep costs, and the type of carriers available. The following are suggestions for this rebalance. First, add a new, small fleet carrier to the game. This could be a kit bash of existing assets or something entirely new. It should be much cheaper than the current large carrier in game, both to buy and upkeep. It should be balanced so that a single commander can manage all its upkeep in an hour or two per week of standard gameplay. It should have fewer landing pads and downscaled versions of services available to commanders at a large carrier. The layout should be optimized for a single wing of commanders, as opposed to the large carrier, which is optimized for massive squadron-level traffic. This small carrier should be the entry-level asset made available to commanders who are primarily self-interested. They don't want to engage with the business management aspects of owning a large carrier, they just want something for logistical support. The small carrier should give its owners a downscaled taste of the possibilities on offer in a large carrier, and could even act as a support ship for the large carriers. The small carrier should have interior services available, like its larger counterpart. The small carrier should be destructible, or at least able to be driven off the same way that a capital interceptor can be. The small carrier should have repair mechanics if attacked, making its positioning a risk-reward calculation. Players should be able to choose whether or not this small carrier appears on the system map, or has to be discovered manually by commanders in the system. 2. Rebalance the large carrier accordingly. As a community-level asset, the large carrier should require more careful planning and execution. It should be more expensive than the small carrier, with higher upkeep, module service, and upgrade costs balanced to assume that multiple commanders will be working together, or that a single commander is particularly savvy at making business decisions about when and where this carrier should be deployed and with what internal resources. 3. Offer large carrier owners an out when the small carrier becomes available. Large carrier owners should be able to trade in the large carrier and receive the small one without needing to put any additional credits in. Excesses on exchange should be credited to the small carrier's account, with the player able to make exchanges accordingly the way that it works now in large carriers. The objective of these changes is to more distinctly divide carrier owners out by their intention, providing players who aren't interested in the business sim or community management aspects a cheaper and less risky alternative to the full-sized carrier, while simultaneously clearing the board for larger carriers to really shine the way they were intended. The Support Economy and Carriers In a previous video, I detailed the ideal support economy in Elite Dangerous, and how the underlying economics of the game strongly disincentivize the use of field repairs. 
Fleet carriers suffer from the same issues competing with stations, as well as needing to compete with other fleet carriers for services. Stations still provide an incredible edge versus players, and carriers, on the cost front alone. Most community groups I play with elect to use the one working station in a system, rather than any of the dozens of closer fleet carriers, because of the tariffs that carriers are required to charge for some of their services. No opportunity for effective competition exists in the very fields that carriers are expected to compete. And that means that much of the operational potential of these vessels is lost in the face of superior default options. Addressing the points I made in my ideal support economy video would overcome much of the direct competition issues exposed here, but it would then place pressure on the next critical flaw, holding these massive ships back. Carrier Logistics Carrier logistics in Elite Dangerous are a chore. Anyone who has ever needed to shovel commodities into their carrier solo for hours on end understands how boring and unengaging this gameplay actually is. It's occasionally worth doing if a community goal offers a particularly shiny bobble, but is often not worth the effort. During the Brewer's CG, I found no compelling reason to slog through this barrier to fun until the overcharged reactors were placed on offer in the final week. Loading and unloading a fleet carrier isn't challenging, isn't strategic, and often involves several frustrating gates of click-button and wait-for-jump gameplay that would not be even remotely tolerable without a podcast or movie open on another monitor. This becomes especially true when a system gets congested with excessive carrier traffic, as happens at almost every community goal. Traffic management is fundamental to managing ports, whether at sea or in the air. There is a tremendous engine for managing this traffic and providing a cost for services. Ports charge a litany of various fees in order to dock, transfer cargo, conduct key maintenance tasks, refuel, and depart. These fees can change based on the size, type, location, and cargo that a ship carries within a given port. Port berths, with easy access to the ocean and high tonnage ratings, often charge more for their use than berths located deeper within the port, carrying lower tonnage rates. Airports work in a similar way, with terminal gates accepting large aircraft like the Airbus A380 and Boeing 787, costing more than gates for a Boeing 737 or a smaller regional flight. Both types of port also charge for time in berth, with some locations charging by the hour or even by the minute, and escalating their cost per hour if ships or aircraft take too long to load or unload. I don't think that a perfect reconstruction of the nickel and dime port bill bureaucracy hellscape that exists in the world right now is a good idea for game design. But the principle behind this system is sound. The following are suggestions that apply to these concepts in Elite Dangerous. 1. Allow fleet carrier owners to select the exact orbit they want around a planet. Orbital position makes a big impact on loading and unloading times near stations. The closer you are to a station or planet, the faster and less boring or frustrating the process becomes. 2. Enable carriers to select Lagrange points around planets as orbital positions. These locations would be perfect places to park a ship, offering excellent positioning relevant to stations or other places in a system that would be far enough out of a gravity well to facilitate more rapid transit between different points in a system. 3. Enable fleet carriers to park next to stations for a limited time window. This will enable optimized loading times and encourage commanders to conduct transfer operations quickly and efficiently by rewarding them for being precise. 4. Implement a jump scheduling system for fleet carriers. This was a major miss on Frontier's part. Jump scheduling enables tremendous flexibility on the part of commanders when selecting their gameplay because it allows carrier logistics to be conducted in the background while doing the things they actually want to be doing in the game. Being able to set carrier jump parameters out several days also creates a predictable, executable scheduling mechanism for player groups to guarantee that a given asset will be in a given system at a given time. It can also provide critical infrastructure for carrier traffic management during high demand events. Five. Charge commanders for premium orbital positions. This method is the way you balance abuse and manage the limited orbital positions in-game. Station mooring orbits, as I call them, where your carrier is in the same physical instance as a station, should always cost something. 
Standard planetary and Lagrange orbits should be free initially, but have scaling costs as system traffic increases. Carriers that were parked in free orbits should be warned if traffic increases to the point where their orbit becomes a premium one. Commanders who jump into a premium orbit define their orbit's parameters when they select it on the galaxy map. The commander chooses the time and length of their arrival and stay, and are then charged credits accordingly when the carrier jumps. Commanders also optionally select a reserve orbit, which the carrier will jump to automatically after the premium orbital permit expires. If no reserve orbit is selected, the carrier will jump to the nearest available free orbit when a premium orbit permit expires. All premium orbits should require at least 100 tons of tritium be present in the carrier's tritium depot before the permit and carrier jump can be issued or executed. Community Coordination Carriers were originally intended as rallying points for commanders to gather and conduct complex operations. One of the consequences of making carriers an individual, as opposed to a collective asset, was the sheer volume of carriers creating a strong disincentive to congregate. I have encountered several situations where players I was coordinating with opted to jump in their own carriers, rather than gather on a single carrier for an activity. Having players spread out the way they do across the thousands of fleet carriers in the game reduces the value proposition that an individual carrier provides as a place for community activity. If you are a newer player, or don't own a lot of ships, carriers don't actually provide much of a meaningful benefit aside from occasionally thumbing a lift from one area to another, or finding a niche rare commodity, opportunities to practically interact are extremely limited. The addition of Odyssey to carriers will help increase their opportunities for use, though not by much, as we'll still be suffering from the same basic issues relating to overabundant competition. The following are suggestions for community-oriented tools. 1. Implement a carrier message board. This feature which should be manageable by owners and those they authorize, can display messages to any docked ships and should be visible from the carrier's home screen or Achilles terminals. Allow an entry from this board to be duplicated in the nav panel description of ships in the system, providing a way for commanders to advertise services without having to rename their carrier to specifically describe them. This message board should integrate with carrier scheduling, should that feature be made available. Owners should have the option to make the carrier's jump schedule public. 2. Allow for messages based on user relationships. Carrier owners should be able to define multiple messages for clients docked based on their status with the carrier owner or the carrier itself as friends, squadron members, and the general public. I cannot understate how useful a feature like this would be, because it would provide a surefire way for all players to be able to see this message without dependence on any third-party tools. It's a simple but essential tool that takes the core features already in the game and magnifies them. Player Trading and Mission Generation Fleet carriers offer an ideal hub for commanders to generate and share transactions. The player-owned commodities market is a great example of this. One of the most important aspects of player coordination is the underlying economic transaction rewarding players for gameplay. Players don't currently have the ability to control these transactions directly. True, they can offer special access to commodities markets on their carriers, but this strategy is more of a high-friction exploit than a full-function feature. Real transaction control would require a means to identify and pay any commander in the game directly. There are a few ways this can be accomplished. 1. Implement a Pay Player function in the comms panel. This system should enable credit transactions at minimum. It should charge a small transaction fee to discourage laundering credits between accounts, and could be expanded to include engineering materials. Transactions should be one-way only, executed by the player paying for a service without the need for the players to be friends. Players who are friends, or who are in the same squadron, should be able to request payment from one another with the option to block or filter out payment requests. 2. Implement a player-generated carrier mission board. Fleet carriers provide an excellent container for housing and managing payment interactions, namely through the creation of player missions. Carrier owners should be able to offer players specific rewards for accomplishing a given task. 
the same way that station mission boards do, with the difference being that the resources on offer are provided from the carrier's accounts. Carrier owner missions should have the ability to control mission expiration times, but there should be a maximum mission time allowed, no longer than a week, to keep incomplete missions from building up in the database. Carrier owners should be able to see a history of missions assigned and completed or failed, along with the commanders who accepted them, providing essential tools for establishing the reliability of different commanders. Carrier owners should be able to establish and manage the reputation status of commanders who perform missions for the carrier, using the same essential mechanics as already exist within the BGS and other game systems. Owners should be able to define how much reputation makes a player cordial, friendly, or allied. Owners should be able to define the carrier's interaction with said players based on status, things like a lower tariff rate, or better terms on mission contracts, or even access to specific types of mission contracts. Other kinds of physical rewards could be attachable to these missions, things like engineered modules owned by the player, or ship hulls from the carrier shipyard. A system like this would supercharge the emergent aspect of Elite Dangerous by allowing players to build their own reward structures on top of the ones that already exist. Fleet carrier owners, particularly those who engage in BGS gameplay, could spend time earning and aggregating credits before doling them out to contractors in exchange for their services. For example, during power play cycles, a carrier can create missions to kill ships belonging to an opposing power. A trade commander could offer additional bonuses for commanders to acquire mining, engineering materials, or other valuable resources, assigning and designating specific quotas to specific commanders for specific rewards, guaranteeing a commander who undertakes the effort the enclosed reward, rather than the current first-come, first-served nature of an open purchase order through the commodities market. Carrier Wholesaling since fleet carriers are able to make and manage large volume purchases by virtue of their massive cargo holds, they should likewise be able to take advantage of wholesale markets when purchasing items for resale to players. This is particularly relevant when discussing ships and modules, but it could also be applied to consumable resources like the ones I proposed in my ideal support video. The essential idea is this. Systems that offer carrier administration or carrier vendor services also have a carrier marketplace. The carrier marketplace essentially acts as a wholesale market where bulk resources can be purchased at a per unit rate less than what would typically be had at a space station or surface settlement directly. The per unit cost should decrease the more volume that a carrier purchases up front. The idea here is to make it so that, even at zero tariff, some profit is made when selling a ship or module to a player, with additional tariffs translating to a greater overall profit. The marketplace should extend to Odyssey content, with specific emphasis on Pioneer Supply's available inventory. The same model could also be applied to bulk commodities purchases from stations, where a carrier is able to pre-purchase a large amount of commodities from a given station through the wholesale market. Bulk commodities purchases should generate a shareable mission for commanders with a fixed time frame for the transaction to be completed. Commanders participating in these missions should load purchase commodities from the mission board as is already done with existing haulage contracts. The cargo, when loaded, is regarded as haulage, attributable to the owner of the carrier or the owner of the mission. This cargo should be listed as stolen if a commander who is not the owner abandons the mission with a full cargo hold. Carrier owners should be able to post these haulage contract missions to the carrier mission board for any commander to be able to complete, and set any additional rewards as necessary to incentivize the contract. Fleet Carrier NPC Interaction Here again, we circle back to the fleet carrier's potential as a business simulator inside a space simulator, and the potential for fleet carriers to be able to utilize NPCs to assist in passive income generation. It has been stated that for balance reasons, fleet carriers aren't allowed to directly interface with the BGS, meaning that carriers can't perform automatic background trading the way that stations and settlements do. There is, however, an alternative to this that should be considered. 1. Using the carrier as the main container for activity, allow carrier owners to hire, equip, and manage NPCs who operate out of their carrier. 
These NPCs all require an initial hiring cost and retainer fees as a base percentage of all profits the carrier generates. NPCs hired are selected from a crew board in a similar fashion to the way NPC crew are hired for ship launch fighters. These NPCs can be randomly generated or derived from aspects of the BGS, allowing different kinds of pilots to appear in the board based on where the carrier is parked. Refinery systems could generate pilots with a mining background, military systems, pilots with combat backgrounds, tourist systems, pilots with passenger backgrounds, and so forth. NPCs can come with or without a ship and with varying degrees of experience. NPCs with ships and experience charge higher premiums. Low-ranked NPCs gain experience as they perform carrier operations. Contracted NPCs can buy upgrades from the carrier as they earn money if those upgrades are available, or from stations they interact with as they conduct operations. The idea is to incentivize commanders who equip shipyards and outfitting by enabling them to recover profits from NPCs who would, logically, purchase upgrades available at the place they work rather than going somewhere else. NPCs who come with or without a ship can have one provided to them by the player from the player's own fleet. This actual ship will be used when the NPC carries out a mission. 2. Players can choose to assign a mission from their mission board to an NPC. During selection, the player determines if the NPC will need escorts, who are also selected from the carrier's pool of NPCs. Once assigned, the NPC departs the carrier to execute the mission. NPC contracts can only be targets in the current system. These missions could be physicalized, but will otherwise take place through a spreadsheet calculation using live system statistics from the BGS to determine if the NPC is intercepted and who intercepts them. The game then calculates the odds of the NPC being destroyed, based on the modules, skill, and background of the pilots being involved. This calculation also determines damage to ships that survive engagement. Models and figures for the chance of mission success should be supplied to the player during the creation of an NPC mission to allow them to accurately evaluate the risk and reward. If the ship or its escorts are destroyed by pirates, security, or a hostile faction, the carrier pays a search and rescue fee, as well as the cost to repair or rebuild any player-owned ships lost or damaged when the engagement takes place. 3. Players can hire dedicated carrier defense ships, who work alongside system security to enforce carrier rules. This should include the option of equipping a carrier ship-launched fighter bay and a squadron of NPCs who can deploy against hostile ships, as well as patrol the local carrier space. Players should have an option to deploy from the ship launch fighter bay and fly around their carrier, supporting the defenses. Carrier combat and the risk of ownership. One of my biggest disappointments with fleet carriers was the inability of players to target and destroy, disable, or damage them. In high competition environments, like those typically found around community goals, this concept adds an extremely dynamic risk factor to the application of a fleet carrier in any environment. Even if fleet carriers cannot be destroyed outright, and instead forced to flee the current system to undergo repairs, the mere existence of this possibility dramatically changes the logic and strategy behind fielding these ships. It would provide a clear-cut point of conflict for PvP, and encourage carrier owners not to leave assets in hostile systems where they can be attacked. Managing the risk of an attack in this way means that carriers in a community goal system are highly incentivized to minimize their time in high traffic areas, and, when combined with the permitting system described previously, would ensure a steady rotation of carriers through high traffic systems, providing more opportunity for players to participate. As game mechanics go, leaving open the possibility of losing your carrier outright makes the ship a lot more meaningful, and effective planning a lot more important even if the carrier battle is very difficult for attackers to execute. Here's one way a carrier battle could work. 1. Carrier weapons no longer have station attributes. They should start at a baseline with a reasonable threat level, and be upgradable to a significant one, on par with the ground defenses at an Odyssey conflict zone. These defenses should be balanced to easily dispatch even the strongest single PvP ship over a couple of minutes. Two. Carrier behavior during attack should be something that players can control, and happen automatically based on parameters defined by the owner. 3. 
Attacking a fleet carrier should take place over several phases, designed to require a certain amount of time to complete. 4. The battle should be engineered so that multiple ships are required. Attacking a fleet carrier should not be possible alone. 5. The engagement itself could work as follows. Phase 1. Engage and suppress a carrier's weapons. This phase is designed to flush out any ships that might be willing to defend, and enables local security to respond. The objective is to destroy a series of main batteries located on the carrier. Once a certain percentage are eliminated, or enough defenders are killed, Phase 2 begins. Phase 2. Hacking Carrier Mainframe. This mechanic requires the attacker to scan at least two data points on the station using a recon limpet, or using a data link scanner. The recon limpet should simplify and accelerate this process compared to a data link scan. Once carrier defenses are successfully hacked, phase three begins. Phase three, destroy heat transfer arrays. Successfully hacking carrier defenses will expose heat transfer arrays in a similar fashion to the ones seen on Imperial and Federal capital ships. These arrays are exposed for a limited time and require attackers to commit primary focus to them. When enough of the arrays are destroyed, the carrier begins its emergency jump sequence. This starts the final phase. The threshold for the emergency jump is a percentage of the heat transfer arrays destroyed, meaning that after a certain number are taken out, this emergency jump sequence will automatically begin. Carrier owners should be able to define this threshold, with the key trade-off being an increase in the carrier's overall chances of survival by allowing the carrier to retreat earlier in the engagement. This means that carriers with a low risk threshold are easier to drive out of a given system, at the cost of being much more difficult for attackers to destroy in the time allowed. Phase 4. Retreat. The emergency countdown clock starts when this phase begins. If this clock reaches zero, the carrier jumps away. The clock duration does not change with the threshold. Defending ships may elect to land and be recovered by the carrier during the retreat phase, but their window to do so is limited by the carrier's pre-jump lockdown, which works as it normally would. Remaining heat transfer arrays can still be targeted and destroyed during the retreat phase. If all arrays are destroyed before the final jump is completed, then the heroic final phase begins. Phase 5. Heroic Phase Losing all heat transfer arrays forces the carrier's reactor to undergo an emergency vent, which exposes the carrier's power plant to attack. This does not halt the jump countdown. Carrier power will malfunction as the reactor is attacked, causing running lights and turrets to malfunction, cutting in and out. Getting too close to the carrier's reactor vents will damage any ship. This discourages ramming and point-blank engagement. If the power plant integrity reaches zero, the carrier enters a doomed state, resulting in a carrier jump sequence abort. All crew and personnel have two minutes to reach an escape pod or relaunch their ships from the hangar bay. Carrier detonation kills everything within 7.5 kilometers instantly. This is to discourage players from camping carrier inhabitants as they retreat. The carrier is lost during detonation, with the owner having the option to rebuild their carrier after the battle. The carrier debris field remains in a degrading orbit, and a new carrier cannot jump into its place in the system for a fixed cooldown period. During the orbital degradation period, debris can be salvaged for engineering materials and commodities that were aboard the carrier. I expect these suggestions will be somewhat controversial, but I am convinced that the mechanics described above will make for a net improvement to the game experience. If I missed something, got it wrong, or otherwise have anything you want to add, feel free to comment below. That's all I have for today, so I'll catch you all later.